You're watching the World News on France 24. And let's get some culture for you now on the programme. France 24's Yenna Lee is with me. Hello, Yenna. Hi, Nadia. Um, you're going to be starting off with the Cannes Film Festival because organisers have just announced the official lineup. Yes, indeed. The 2020 edition was cancelled due to COVID. But Cannes is back this year. The world's biggest film festival is set to kick off on July 6th. Organisers have now unveiled their nominations for the much-awaited official selection. Let's cross over now to our film critic, Lisa Nesselson, who listened to that uh, press conference. Lisa, what are some of the films we should be keeping an eye out for? Well, absolutely all of them. This is the time that I absolutely love when everything is a potential masterpiece because we just don't know that much about them. Uh, there are 24 films in the official competition, which means that the jury will be watching a minimum of two films a day, and on at least two days, they'll have three to contend with. And then, of course, there's the sidebar with another 18 films with names of people we've never heard of, but which may be the great filmmakers of tomorrow. I can tell you some of the things that I'm looking forward to. Um, we have uh, Pet Petrov's Flu by Kirill Serebrennikov, who uh, made the wonderful movie Leto and uh, was not allowed to come to Cannes because he was under house arrest in his uh, native Russia. And uh, this film seems to be about the um, what happens to people when they are deprived of their freedom. In fact, um, the uh, the festival director uh, Thierry Frémaux said that there was uh, a lot of films in the 1900 or so that were submitted that were about uh, either the mysteries of coupledom or the fear of losing your freedom, of losing uh, your ability to live your life, and also several about what it's like to be stuck at home, either by choice or because it's been imposed upon you. I'm also very curious about Todd Haynes has made a documentary about the Velvet Underground, and of course his uh, rock and roll credentials are impeccable, and I bet that's going to be quite interesting. And uh, there's a movie in competition that was ready last year had the festival taken place. In fact, there were several. The opening night film, um, Annette, uh, is one of them. Also, Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch. And what I'd like to talk about is Paul Verhoeven's uh, Benedetta, which is based on the true journals of a 17th century lesbian nun. And uh, I believe we have some Im images from that. Sœur est coupable du blasphème dont vous l'accusez, elle ira au budget. Mais des accusations extraordinaires exigent des preuves extraordinaires. Je ne sais pas comment Dieu fait arriver les choses. Je sais seulement qu'il accomplit sa volonté à travers moi. Tu dois faire des aveux complets. Ah, Quite a Eurocentric lineup then for the uh, official selection this year, with the, with the exception of a few films. Can may be back, but the pandemic is still ongoing. Lisa, what are some of the uh, COVID restrictions this year? Well, they were very, very enthusiastic about being one of the first major in-person events that will be welcoming people from literally all over the world. Uh, a year ago, they didn't really know how to carry on a sporting event without an audience, and they certainly didn't know how to manage a film festival. Now, they seem to have thought of an awful lot. For example, the city of Cannes, in a building that's very close to uh, the central auditorium, from 8 in the morning till 8 at night, will be offering free of charge to visit and festival attendees uh, salivary tests so that you can keep up with your uh, viral status. Of course, they will be admitting people uh, to France and uh, to the uh, screenings who can prove via a QR code or some sort of uh, recognized passport that they have been vaccinated or are free of the virus. And uh, as of June 30th, um, the, uh, the nation here is planning to no longer have any restrictions on how many people can sit together close together in the same room. So there'll be 100 percent capacity. As I'm speaking, it's still only 35 percent. And uh, we will be able to presumably enjoy something and not worry about the people around us. We'll probably all still be wearing masks. The, the south of France was very good about vaccinating people. They were one of the portions of the nation that had the highest number of vaccinated people very early on. And it's kind of funny to think back to a little over a year ago, the Palais des Festivals, where the screenings take place. 
it was being used to put up homeless people and uh, and provide for their health and make sure that they got fed. So it's an incredible pendulum of going from the down and out to, uh, you could say, the elite, the privileged, and those of us who are fortunate enough to sit in the dark in one of the most beautiful sunny places on Earth. All right, thank you for that, Lisa Nesselson. Um, Nadia France 24 will, of course, be going to the French Riviera to cover that festival. Yeah, it won't be me, and I'm quite jealous of them. Lots to look forward to at the Cannes Film Festival, Yenna. But before Cannes kicks off, um, you want to talk to us about a documentary on international adoption. What's it all about? Well, Une Histoire à Soi, or A Story of One's Own, centres around five adult adoptees reclaiming the narrative surrounding their adoption. The film tackles really complex issues such as transracial adoption, displacement and identity. Director and writer Amandine Gear was herself adopted by white parents. She was on our show earlier and I asked her why she chose to approach uh, this topic from the point of view of adoptees. When I was de l'avion, I tout de suite voulu rentrer to Rwanda. J'ai jamais senti en fait vraiment de différence entre le fait que moi je suis adoptée et pas les autres en fait. Je me suis construite comme une enfant blanche finalement, comme une enfant blanche de l'intérieur et asiatique de l'extérieur. Well, I'm always trying to make the film that I needed to see when I was a teenager, and so I think it's really important to start with life stories because everybody can identify to them, but it's also a good way to politicize the issue. Because quite often, when you're talking about adoption, especially in the media or for the general public, uh, it is quite centered on emotions and sentiments. And of course, those are parts of you know, all families' history. But in adoption, you have racial issues, you have displacement issues, especially if it's transnational adoption. You have a whole range of political uh, things that are happening even in the relationship between you know, uh, parents and children, and it's really uh, rarely uh, tackled. So it was important for me to bring that forth, but using people's life stories so that adoptees could relate to the stories and feel empowered by the political aspect of it. Now you can watch the uh, full interview again at 5.15 Paris time or online. Yana, thanks very much for coming in to talk to us. France 24's Yana Lee uh, for you there.